while we sleep, the guardians of the night take to the streets, having said goodbye to those they love. Each other knowing they may never say these words again, they face the evil that we run from. They dedicate their lives to those that would hate them because they wear the badge. They wear the badge not for the glory or recognition, but for the passion to help others. This is the LEO First Podcast. We'll talk to the men and women in law enforcement, those that have retired, those that keep the prisons secure, and anyone who's impacted by law enforcement. We'll peel back the curtain, and you'll get the real stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Every law enforcement officer has a story to tell. Get ready to hear from the men and women who put their lives on the line every day for their communities and their country. Welcome to the LEO First Podcast. Now, here's your host, Michael Laidler. Hey everybody, it's Michael Laidler, the host of the LEO First Podcast, and we're coming back to you with another amazing episode. Tonight's episode is always going to it's going to be a unique one like all the other ones we have. I have a person on here who I met through LinkedIn and just looking at his vast history, it was so much that I was like, "You know what? I'm just going to stop looking because I'd rather him explain it versus me trying to decipher it." So, we have a guest on that's going to bring a lot of knowledge, a lot of information from all levels of law enforcement with nearly 25 years of it plus an author, all the stuff you want to see when it comes to some of the people we we bring on here. And obviously, you guys know one of the goals is always to humanize the badge, whether you're in law enforcement or you're related to somebody in law enforcement, whatever it might be, just to let you know that we all have things going on in our lives, but we're making strides to make people better, make ourselves better, make something better. And I know the guests that we have on tonight will do that. Our guest tonight will be Keith Gr- Grunsell. I hope I, oh boy, I, I, and I don't edit things out. You guys know that. So (laughs) Keith, I hope I got it right. Uh, You can say it again to make sure I didn't mess it up, but Keith, tell us about you. What do you want us to know about you? Hey, Michael. Uh, First off, thanks for having me on here, man. It's a, it's a true pleasure to be speaking to fellow law enforcement officers uh, all around the area. But uh, but one thing to know about me, you know, I'm not only a law man, but I'm a family man as well. Um, you know, my career, chosen career, was law enforcement, and I feel truly blessed. I feel like I've lived possibly like 10 lives in this position, you know, having worked at the city, county, state, federal, and international levels of law enforcement. Uh, I bring a lot to the table, and, and it's been pretty eye-opening experience for me throughout the last 25 years. I love how you talked about family man pretty early on. And I think that's important when it comes to understanding where our values need to lie. Now, I always tell people, you you have to have a job, you have to have some kind, you're going to work for some organization some way or another, whether it's for them or with them. But your values start with you, and then you should value your family time as well. So you start off early as a family man. So tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, I'm really blessed. I have four children, um, ages 19, 16, 13, and 6. Um, the six-year-old child of mine is uh, actually was adopted, and um, he's been a blessing in disguise. Uh, I spent many years, uh, six years actually, overseas working on U.S. Department of State contracts, and it was an opportunity that came up. Um, this young child was uh, born addicted to drugs, mm-hmm. and um he needed a place to go and uh, we knew who his mother was who had been suffering with from addiction most of her life and uh, we prayed about it and uh, decided to do it and uh, next thing you know six years later <laughs> he's been a part of our lives and, and a blessing and at the point when that happened we had actually just gotten all of our kids in school so bringing in a, a one week old that weighed four pounds that had an addiction that you had to administer methadone to was you know, quite an experience and quite an endeavor, but, you know, you don't realize that as a person that you can love another child just as much as your own blood until you've adopted. You know, it's interesting, and I don't think any of my prior guests has ever talked about either 
having an adopted kid or being around adopted kid or themselves being adopted. Actually, no, I had one person who said they were adopted. Um, but I didn't really think about that part of the family dynamic, especially like what you guys did, because like you're saying that you already had three. So it wasn't like that was your first one or your second yeah. one. Like this is adding number four. to already a, a trifecta already. So like when it came to balancing your, your, your work life, and now you got a four pound year old baby, that's like you said, a week old that you now have to give methadone to like, like, how does that, how, how does that time management work or how, how did it work back then? Well, for me, it was, it was one of those things where I felt like I, I'm the type of leader that likes to practice what I preach. I don't want to just be somebody that talks and I devoted the vast majority of my career to drug enforcement from working six years deep undercover to working internationally in Afghanistan, Haiti, uh, in Liberia, West Africa, everything I did, there was a drug nexus. Well, when this opportunity came and I found out that this little baby hunter was born addicted to drugs, I felt like it was God almost testing me. You know, you're going to put your money where your mouth is. You're always preaching that you want to help. You know, you don't just, but I don't believe you can arrest your way out of the drug problem. You know, I believe you have to get uh, addicts help. You have to go after the traffickers hardcore and then here's an opportunity for me to practice what I preach at home on top of my job and it was it definitely threw threw a kink in things you know but my daughter who's my 13 year old uh now um at the time obviously at six years younger she became all of a sudden from little baby girl to big sister and uh that really was something that made her grow tremendously she took on almost like a motherly figure role and it was, it was pretty fascinating to see that my two boys you know they both obviously jumped on board with it as well and they're kind of kind of not only like extremely old much older bigger brothers versus you know kids two to three years apart isn't it crazy how adaptive children are oh man they're they're resilient they're amazing you know me i I, I've forced my kids to overcome and adapt quite often. You know, like I said, I spent six years deployed overseas, uh, six years deep undercover where I was gone a lot. That's 12 years, especially out of my, my 19 year old's life. And uh, I grew up a military brat. My dad was all over the place, uh, went overseas for a year. He was a Marine for 22 years. I uh, was born out of Buford Naval Hospital while he was assigned to Paris Island, lived in California, Louisiana. Uh, Washington, D.C., then settled back into South Carolina. So I, I learned to overcome and adapt due to my environment, and I think that's kind of what, what's happened with my children. May not have been as, as many moves, but they've learned through, you know, seeing their dad always gone and things like that in a different environment. So I think, I think it builds character in people and will help them later on in life. And it's true. I mean, I, I I don't know where I don't know what I was reading or watching over like the last week or so, but I felt like whatever I I I, I don't want to misquote the the terminology I heard, but to paraphrase it, they said some of the best pe some of the best people have come from adversity, have come from things that Amen. have challenged them versus maybe the silver spoon type, which I don't honestly I. I don't think yeah. as many people are given a silver spoon as we think they are. Maybe they have money, yeah. but even people that have money struggle. Well, I, you know, throughout the course of my career, uh, obviously the adversity and the struggles that you go through, you know, determine who you are deep down inside. Uh, I remember when I was uh, my first time, I'm a two-time chief of police, currently chief of police in Lawrence, South Carolina. I was a chief in, in another upstate city. Um, I was asked to do some things by certain elected officials that I refused to do. Um, as a result, I was, I was terminated immediately. And I fought for 14 months, got my job back. I got full back pay for 14 months, came back, indicted the mayor for public corruption. Uh, he got uh, convicted of two of three charges, uh, crimes against moral turpitude, could never run for political office ever again. Uh, the head of investigations for 25 years was uh, pled guilty to a case where he covered up uh, the white suspects in a racially motivated uh, rape and murder. Uh, and then, you know, so for me, I, I encountered a, a ton of adversity in those situations. And because I was a whistleblower, 
I, I became kind of public enemy number one because people thought I was just stirring the pot. But in actuality, only time told that I was actually the guy that was trying to do the right thing. So what that did for me is it built a lot of character in me, and it taught me, you know, you know, you can't become jaded in, in the situations that you encounter in life. How you respond to adversity defines your true character inside. Are you going to come out a negative? disgruntled individual that hates everybody and blames everybody for what you went through? Or are you going to say, okay, God, thank you for putting me through that because I know you're building me stronger for something much bigger, even though I may not know at this moment what that is, yeah. but I know you're building me up for something. And that's truly how I, how I look at things. I've faced a ton of adversity, not just in that situation, but from working overseas, working locally, uh, undercover, all that stuff. It, it's just been a constant roller coaster of a career. And as you know, that's what law enforcement is. You know, you could be sitting one day sipping on a coffee, next second, you know, you're picking up body parts from an accident. I mean, you just you just don't know what you're going to encounter. And that's one of the reasons I got into law enforcement. I didn't want to sit behind a desk all day long and do the same exact thing, or be on an assembly line in a factory doing the exact same thing day in and day out for 25, 30 years. I just wasn't in my character or my makeup. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm so grateful that I did choose being a public servant because I believe it's, it's the best career choice for somebody like me. Yeah, and and the career path that you did choose, you're definitely never going to be uh, – you're never going to have a dull moment. Either, like you said, even if you just want to sip coffee and not yeah. have one, you're going to – that when, when you think that nothing's going to happen, that's usually when uh, the bottom falls out. <laughs> and it comes in threes as you know so when, when it happens it happens pretty bad three times and uh that's 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 the story of my life especially in a, in a top leadership position you know as the chief of police um everything can be going what you perceive as great one moment and then like you said the whole bottom falls out and then you're in a like a three four day scramble trying to trying to fix things and it seems like it's going okay then it happens again and how you adjust to that you know how you adapt do you do you become just disgruntled about everything and not somebody who's friendly to your staff or, or do you just kind of flow go with the flow a little bit and that's something that as a guy that's kind of a, a type a a high strong uh goal driven guy you know that's something that i've only gained that wisdom to handle those situations over time as a young rookie cop I would have handled things drastically different than I handle them now. Uh, I'm less quick to react and, and realize that just some people are just dumb. You know what I'm saying? Some people do certain things on social media and say certain things, and me responding to that stoops me down to their level, and I'm not willing to do so. So, I've, But I had to learn that lesson <laughs> by being the guy that actually did respond. So, I mean, that's something that comes with growing and growth, especially as a public servant. And it's and it's true, though. I mean, like like you said, like, I mean, a lot of things you go through as a leader. And as I thought about your story, especially what, what happened with you getting fired and had, had to fight to get your job back and uh, essentially exposing the corruption that was there. A lot of times we hear the narrative being a little different in a sense of usually you hear yeah. non-supervisory staff, for example, an officer going through this or a corporal going through this, a deputy, whatever it might be, uh, versus the chief going through it. Like, you usually don't hear too many chiefs be willing to say, you yeah. know what, hey, we're we're bullied, we're harassed, we're, we're looked at it the other way just as well. However, we still have to maintain a certain character, though it's tough. So when you're going through this stuff, like, like how is this impacting, like, your family life? Oh, absolutely. You know, I always say just looking at the bigger picture with chiefs, if you're making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis in order to just keep your job instead of what's doing what's right, then you need to get the heck out of this line of work. You know, you should always make decisions based on what's right, not based on keeping your job. And I see that a lot in politics. People choose the political route on things. I've tried not to do that. I'm in a great position now where I have a, a phenomenal mayor, city council, city administrator, everything. Total opposite of what I had my first go round. So, but yeah, it affects, it affects your family life drastically. You know, I had um, shots fired at my house. I had my dog poisoned and killed. 
Wow. Um, I had threats c- coming in the mail, stuff that the media didn't want to jump all over. And uh, but it it happened, and it happened directly after I would report things. And uh, what did I do? I stayed the course, but I was hyper vigilant as well. It was a time where I had my family go out of state for a little while. Um, it, it, it's something that an officer should never have to experience, and I don't say that to deter people from achieving the highest levels, but I say never be naive. You know, I came into it as a young chief in my 30s and, and was like, you know, I had heard there was some corruption, but I was like, you know, I'm always going to do the right thing. Nobody will ever get anything on me if, as long as I do the right thing. Well, that's not the truth. The reality is people will lie sometimes people that have political, you know, agendas and things like that. And it could be used against you. But for me, you know, I won in the end, you know, just by doing the right thing, staying the course. But the battle with my family took its toll. Um, You know, it it led to me after I, I, I came back for about two and a half years after I was fired, came back two and a half years. We went from number 28 safest city in the state to number one safest city in the entire state of South Carolina. Um, We had those indictments and all the stuff going on. An election happened and some of the people that got indicted, they they brought in some people to run and basically to oust me as a chief. And it was a hot political bed. And so I resigned um, and I went overseas again. And that was (laughs) kind of like, you know, I, I was ready to get out of you know, the local political scene. And, and I went overseas and I went to Haiti of all places. As you know, wow. that's a, a very political hotbed. Yeah, but I got there and I quick, quickly rose to the ranks there. I was on a U.S. Department of State contract assigned to the United Nations. I became the U.S. contingent commander for the nation there with all the U.S. forces. And I was assigned to the Haitian SWAT team. And, uh, man, that was um, one of the most deadly environments. Uh, a lot worse than what I ever experienced in Afghanistan for the two years I lived in Afghanistan as well. Um, Haiti was off the charts and it's very sad. Such a great group of people that I work with there. Uh, I work with over 30 different national police forces Mm -hmm. and um, just, it was such a great experience um, seeing the diversity amongst all the different law enforcement agencies and how we come together to assist a, a nation, but obviously that country, you know, the United Nations pulled out, the U.S. somewhat pulled out, and then they assassinated the president shortly after I left and shot the first lady, and uh, it's been quite unstable continuously ever since, and uh, it almost is one of those situations where it's so bad that it might take the United States Marines coming in to correct it. Wow. Yeah, and and doing that so when you went from obviously south carolina to haiti like did you leave your family back here how how did that work yeah it's it's what they call a non-family friendly mission it Um, sounds like that definitely can't yeah i can't bring your family um it was very very violent um especially being assigned so originally i got there i was a national coordinator well i lived with the bangladeshi uh uh, form police units, SPUs, it's a 160 person unit. And then I got promoted within about three months to the national coordinator over 11 countries, 1,650 guys. And I uh, did that. And then they wanted me to be with the Haitian SWAT team, which was kind of weird because the Haitian SWAT team was actually an anti-coup unit to protect the president from an overthrow. Mm-hmm. And um, that's how they originally were founded. So I got to see a lot of the behind the scenes types of things, got to meet the president and got to got to train the prime minister's security detail, uh, some of the presidential security detail, met some pretty amazing uh, Haitians and uh, other people from around the world that, that I still stay in touch with, which is which is pretty neat. But yeah, it was it was definitely quite different than what I expected. I was going into what I they call a peacekeeping mission, but it ended up being um just as deadly, if not more deadly than Afghanistan, because of the fact that it wasn't considered a war zone and you're in soft skin vehicles sometimes. And you know, at least in Afghanistan, yeah, for you're the prepared. Years I was there, we were fully armored vehicles. I was uh, the, the uh, national supervisor over three programs there. We, I had 144 Americans that worked under me, and we trained up, up to a 5,000 man SWAT team. 
for the whole nation of Afghanistan. And that, that was a, a awesome experience as well. I was one of my first high, high level leadership positions. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot um, of people too. that's a lot was, of people to train. Whew, man, it, it was, and, and we had to deal with, we were on a U.S. Department of State contract in a Department of Defense war zone. <laughs> so you had DOS and DOD conflicts and, there was a lot of dynamics that you had to work with with the international community and you had cultural differences. And, um, you know, for me, that, that was a, a growing experience and it was very tough to be away from home six plus months at a time. And, uh, but I, I don't, I don't regret it. I, I enjoyed my time there. And then my last tour overseas, I, I left Haiti and went to Liberia to West Africa and uh, I became the senior advisor to the inspector general there who's appointed by the president. And um, that was a pretty amazing position. Um, it just survived Ebola prior to that, survived a, a civil war. Um, it was a tribal culture of 16 tribes, and they were dealing with ramifications of both of those you know, situations and, and the aftermath of child soldiers who were growing up who did horrific things from cannibalism to murder. And uh, so you're dealing with that in the culture at the same time as policing. And policing in Africa is different from policing in America. Half the police officers there didn't even carry guns. And um, then you had specialized police units. And it was uh, was pretty cool, though, man. The inspector general there, Patrick Tosadu, was appointed and... uh, Right when I got there, and he selected me to be a senior advisor out of a few of us, and uh, he's still the, I think he's the longest acting inspector general in the history of the nation of Liberia, which I think is pretty impressive, and he's a pretty great leader, and, and I wish him nothing but the best. I hope he continues to prosper in that country. So with all of this going on, a lot of moving around, going back and forth, obviously across seas and um, having multiple kids, adopting there was a point in your life where you wrote a book <laughs> called a yeah. Tale, or a, a series book. Yeah. So where did, like, yeah. when did you find time or was this just more recent that, that you decided that you were going to do this Narc's tale? So it originally started with, you know, I'm working undercover. Um, I had to make up a big scandal that I got fired because I was supposed to be trying to take out some dirty cops. And uh, so I kind of got shunned by my own, you know, group of people, law enforcement officers. And I was kind of by myself. So I started writing down notes as therapy. Well, I had done this for 15 years. Well, when I went overseas, I started actively getting into it a little bit more and organizing it into like a book format. And I had never written a book. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, So I I wrote like a police officer, like a police reporter for the most part. (laughs) So I had to learn, you know, to put everything instead of like, I used to write a lot, as, especially when I was a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration, I wrote it in third person. I had to go back to writing it differently from a first person perspective. And uh, so it was my therapy. And when I went overseas, I had a lot of downtime in the evening and, and I wrote. But what really put the hat on me with my books was I was in Liberia and COVID hit. And I got quarantined by myself for 22 weeks. Dang. And I, yeah. So once a week, I could go to the grocery store for 30 minutes. They got it shut down. We can go in. I was, you know, working with the, the president, not the president directly, but with the inspector general, the prime minister, all them on, on basically the, the response to that. But I was stuck in my apartment. And I was like, wow, I have to keep my mental health squared away I I was working out in there doing like exercises on YouTube and things like that but you only have so many hours in a day to exercise and I I devoted about 12 to 15 hours a day for 22 weeks and originally I had one book but then it just kept growing and growing and growing and eventually turned into four books so my first book is my my upbringing and some life experiences that set me on track to become a police officer or almost not become a police officer because of some bad choices at a young age. And then that's undercover as a city police officer. Then my second and third books are all about my deep undercover experience as a county sheriff's deputy for three years. And then my fourth book is 
my undercover experience becoming a, a U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration special agent uh, with DEA. And then at the end, it kind of touches about fighting corruption as a chief. Then it tells little short stories about my time overseas and how there was always a drug nexus. And I tell the story about my son, you know, Hunter being adopted and things like that, about his background. So the whole book series is called A Narc's Tale. And it really goes into a lot of behind the scenes stuff from uh, the little things you do working deep undercover um, to the psychological effects, how it affected my family, um, what I did to overcome things, how I almost crossed over the line a couple of times, just, mm-hmm. just getting caught up in, in this persona of who I, I was pretending to be for so many years. And um you know, and and it was kind of not only a therapy to write them, but it was for my kids. So one day they'll read them and be like, okay, that's what daddy was doing <laughs> for those six years. That's why dad, you know, was maybe looking different once a week. He changed his look or something and, and he was gone all the time. I hope they realized I was actually trying to make some sacrifices to make it a better world. Yeah. You know, and the the cool part that about the books is that, it does share your story. And I know most people that have a book or have multiple books, however many it might be, they talk about how therapeutic it is to kind of get your thoughts on paper. So did you find that to be pretty consistent? I did, but I'll tell you what, I was nervous because number one, it's final, you know, when you put it out there and I didn't, I would say, I would have never published the books. I originally was going to just write something for my kids. And until like TV shows started coming out where they were following narcotics units and DEA agents and kind of showing everything, what really happens, you know, behind the scenes, I would have never published if that wouldn't have come out. Um, so it was therapeutic, but it was nerve wracking because it's like when you print it, it's solid. And uh, how are people going to perceive your stories? You, you don't know. Are they going to be like, man, that's, that's horribly written. It sounds like a, just a police report or are they going to enjoy it? You know, are they going to, is it, is it for a much broader audience, you know? And, and I've found through time that it is, it's for a much broader audience. Obviously cops relate to it. Uh, people who know me well relate, um, older community relates to it. The younger generation, I've had parents get it and read it for their kids. I've read stories at, at the local, uh, like uh, alternative school where the kids uh-huh. who got kicked out of school and I talked to them about drugs. I read some stories. And uh, so it's been pretty neat, but that's kind of what sparked me recently. And I haven't told anybody this, but I actually am in the final phase. I'll probably be done in the next, within a week of finalizing my fifth book. Um, wow. it, it's it's, it's kind of crazy though, because it's a children's book. And uh, I felt like just uh, society has, diminished in values tremendously with our with our youth and i felt like i I wrote out like 29 or 30 lessons that i believe every child should be taught from proper use of the internet you know and not sharing inappropriate things to chivalry which is something that you know kind of died out a little bit to not bullying people to not cheating to respecting your elders to respecting authority figures and each it was unique. It was easier for me to write it because it's much shorter, a children's book. But then I had to get into getting the illustrator and making sure the, the story matched the illustrations. And that took quite some time for me. And uh, then making the stories rhyme to where they're fun to read for seven to 12 year olds. And uh, so, yeah, so I'll probably have that out. I'm hoping I was hoping to have it out like. But uh, the illustrations, I was back and forth with my artists getting things and i got them all done and they're I'm doing the cover design right now and uh so yeah i so i and i've been writing a leadership book as well um but those are things they are my therapy like you said and for me it's pretty neat though to leave a legacy you know in paper my my children's book is uh caleb's journey to kindness and caleb's my oldest son and it has a character in it called wise craig who's my father craig and um, all the characters are actually my children, which you don't know that, but you'll see them throughout the book. And it's going to be a surprise. I mean, I'm telling you here, I haven't even told them 
So they have they have no no clue. So I was hoping to get it out by Christmas so I could have, you know, give them a copy for Christmas. And uh, I thought that'd be something touching and kind of a unique gift. But that's cool though. I mean, it's it's as you're talking about writing all these things. How did you learn these different writing styles? Like because I know for me, like I know I wrote my book, but I mean it was more to me just kind of yeah. But I mean, call me. I have I'm college educated, so I, that's some of the help. I've written papers before, but like like yeah. you're writing different. Like it ain't like you're just writing one type of book. You're writing multiple styles. So like, how did you learn all these styles? Man, I will tell you, I, I I reached out. A buddy of mine has written over ten books. Jason Fort, uh, he's a police officer in Anderson, South Carolina, and um, been doing it twenty something years. Mm-hmm. And I reached out to him now. I originally, it's kind of unique. I was originally writing everything 100% nonfiction, you know, true stories, everything. And then I had to, to present some things to an attorney. And I said, hey, what do you think about this? I'm about to publish this undercover book. And he's like, well, I think you should call it a, a fiction based upon a true story. Even if it's 100% true, change the, all the names and all the locations. And that way, nothing can come back on you. And so that's what I ended up doing. Although the stories are 100% true, I changed all the names, the identities to protect people. And even people, you know, that serve their time. I, I truly feel like, you know, people can change. Even if I put, I put a lot of people in prison for 20 plus years, 10 plus years who have gotten out recently, you know, and I run into them. I've ran into quite a few. Hell, when I was a new chief here, I ran into one almost first few weeks on the job, and I didn't even recognize him. And he walks up to me, shake, goes to shake my hand. He's like, "You remember me?" I was like, "Man, you look familiar, but I, I don't know where <laughs> yeah. from." He's like, "He's like, you put me in prison," and and all my kids, everybody standing there, like, "Uh oh, here we go." <laughs> so <laughs> what, what, what's going to happen next? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he gave me a gave me a hug, and he said, "Man, you saved my life. I'd be dead right now." It wasn't for you. I was going down the wrong path. I said, man, I'm happy to see that. And he has, you know, small children, a wife. And, you know, that that's what it's about, man. I, I, I've had guys that I that I flipped, turned informant, and they were facing 20-plus years. And I remember one, I, I dismissed all his charges on him. And he ended up going in the Army, active duty, spent over 10 years, got out as a sergeant. Went and worked for uh, a major uh, contracting company. Now he's a big wig in the paper paper industry, and uh, he calls me about every year or two, most of the time around Christmas, and puts me on a, a speakerphone with his wife and his daughters, and tells me thank you. You know, he, he would have been in prison, but was he a good good guy? Yes. Did he get mixed up in the wrong crowd, and you know, this is, got him into it with a woman, but. Yeah, I mean, I, so what I tell young officers is, man, not everybody, just because they do some some stupid things in life or bad things, you know, doesn't mean they're totally evil. You know, we, we all have emotions and, and we make bad decisions. And uh, so don't take everything so personal. And you see a lot of officers, like, they get – they take everything from a speeding ticket personal all the way to a felony drug arrest personal. And you can't. Unless somebody tried to kill you or something like that, that's different. You know what I'm saying? They they ain't gonna you know gonna push it out. But even then you have to you have to at some point let it go or else emotionally this job will eat you alive. Easily. You're right. And when you're fine you when you find yourself mentoring these younger officers and giving them that kind of advice, what kind of reception have you found yourself receiving? I get a lot of calls, you know, um back. They'll be like, all right, this is what I encountered. What do you think about this? Well, I got written up at work for this. And, uh, well, uh, and and generally, most of the time, especially being a chief now, you know, have, having been a, com- uh, a high-level supervisor over 20 years now in my career, a chief over 10, you know, I, I, I see things a little differently, you know. and But I also like to hear their perspective, too, because I like to keep it real and keep it grounded. You know, because I like to understand what this younger generation is thinking. But I get a lot of a lot of feedback from them, and uh, and sometimes I'm able to calm them to where they don't jump ship. Because one of the common things I see with younger officers that I've tried to mentor, or, or even my own officers and and other agencies, is 
they'll get disciplined for something that they've been warned and warned about, and then they'll get a formal write-up or something. And it's right. the end of the world of these guys. They want to go work for another agency immediately, and they think the grass is always greener. They don't realize the, the 10 times you didn't write them up for doing similar things. You know, they don't look at that. They just look at the write-up, and they think it's the end of the world. And But you have to be consistent, you know, as, as a leader as well and, and let, it, let people know they'll be held accountable. But you don't want them walking on eggshells. You don't want people coming in micromanaged. You don't want people feeling like they can't be innovative in their approach to law enforcement. Because the, the second you take away their ability to to be themselves, um, you got robots, and, and robots are not good police officers. And they're not productive in general because then they find themselves stressed out for things that aren't necessarily things they should be stressed out with. Yeah. So you take away that that freedom to kind of be a free thinker and a kind of being stress-free i mean it's it's it, it takes a toll on the body it does and, and you want them to have fun like we hire people for their personalities and their ability to help people and i think i see you'll see some young officers that'll come in and they present this front that which i believe is real but it's their front that they're presenting during the interview of I want to help everybody, I want to do this, I'm all about the people, and they'll hit the ground running. They'll come back from the academy, get out of their FTO, and then they find this, what I call, robot phase of law enforcement, where they write tickets like crazy, <laughs> and they're just like reciting case law to every person they stop, just because they, they're proud that they know it, and it helps them to remember it, and they just forget the human factor, and then if they never get out of that, they usually don't survive in this career. But if they, once they realize, okay, slow it down a little bit, everybody, you know, that you pull over for speeding is a murderer, you know what I'm saying, and, and not everybody's a bad person, and this ticket is going to make the insurance companies rich more than anybody else, so let's use a little discretionary power every once in a while. Once they get to that point, they're probably going to make it in this career. But if they can't put that human factor back into it and remember what, why they wanted to become a cop before becoming a cop, mm -hmm. then they won't make it. So that's important. So that's one of the things that I, I talk about a lot. Like I talk about self-awareness, but understanding who you are before you put the uniform on. And then obviously who you are when you're like, once you put the uniform on, like still remembering like your identity. Yeah. So, how 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 yeah. are like how how do you how have you been seeing that change like from your perspective either from the chief's role from the the Arthur role or just the industry in general how do you see us moving in a better direction on that or do you see because of things like and I'm just gonna this something random popped in my head like staffing yeah. so bad that people don't have time to focus on themselves like what shifts are you seeing from your perspective because it is much different yeah. as a chief than it would be as an officer. It is, but I, I can say this, uh, the buck stops at the chief. Uh, reality is this, if, if I come in and I'm squared away the way I look, uh, I work out every day, um, I'm fit for duty, then my staff's gonna start taking on that same role. Um, it's the vision of the leader that, that squares everybody away. Like my, my, my staff, I allow them to work out on duty uh, we have a fitness standard that that we go by. Um, I've had many, many people since I got in there. I've been in this last chief position just about 15 months now. And um, and I've had many people lose 20, 30 pounds since wow. I've come there, just living a healthier lifestyle. I'm not Mr. Super Fit, but I work out seven days a week. You know, but I'm 48 years old, and I believe, you know, functional fitness is very important. And uh, – I think if the leader does it, it'll follow. And um, there, I don't have a lot of tolerance for laziness because I have high, high, high expectations. I set goals consistently uh, for myself, for my department. Uh, I have long-term vision, and, and I'm always moving forward towards that. And sometimes that doesn't allow me to, to celebrate the small wins along the way, but it definitely sets a precedent 
of expectations. And, and you can say, you know, from looks is one thing, but let's say the other is attitude. It's uh, different cultures and younger generation of officers. One of my major pet peeves as the chief of police is if I hear a young officer tell uh, a citizen that called in to have something investigated, uh, yeah, we pulled like we pulled the video and it's blurry. Uh, there's nothing else we can do. Tell somebody there's nothing else you can do. There's a million other avenues you may not know because you're a rookie officer. But back in the day, we didn't have video. Correct. You know, Correct. Beat the street, <laughs> yeah. knock, knock on doors. But we are blessed in our agency. We have 25 SWAT cameras right around the city. Pull some license plates, you know, see what cars travel through that area at certain times. You know, there's other factors that you can do it. And the younger officers, I see that a lot because they don't have the experience to be able to think about the other things other than, oh my God, the video is blurred. So now I have nothing. Or one of my other pet peeves is um, saying, uh, sir, ma'am, that's a civil matter. Uh, you need to handle that civilly in civil court. Uh, no, a civil matter is something that you can be a dispute resolution person, a problem solving police officer, a right. peacekeeper. You can come in and try and figure out what this neighbor, neighborly dispute is, and maybe you can mediate that and make it a peaceful neighborhood. You know, and if you don't mediate it and you don't attempt to mediate it, it's more than likely going to escalate, and it may escalate to a criminal matter where somebody gets hurt or killed. So don't come in there and say, we can't do anything else. Make, make people feel that you're going to do everything in your power to solve this case for them. I don't care how small it is. To them, it is the biggest thing in their life. You know, just like somebody complaining about speeding in their neighborhood. The number one complaint we get is speeding, traffic. Everybody drives. So if that person who's calling about speeding, you blow them off, that's police. But to yeah. them, speeding is their biggest problem. But right. to the lady who lives next door to the drug trafficker, that's their biggest problem. You got to take that one as serious as you do the speeding. And everything you do as a police officer, you have to show that empathy for people and that compassion and let them know that they're heard and, and that you're taking their, their situation serious. And if people feel like they're heard, you're not going to get complained on. They're going to actually support you even if you can't solve the case. Well, because people, like you said, they just want to be heard sometimes. And once you essentially like you said, you don't just say, well, we only tried one option. That's it. You do everything you can within your power to help them. And even if you can, yeah. like, you know what, I'm going to call this officer or I'm going to call this group. Maybe they can help out. You know, people appreciate, we all appreciate that whether we're in a uniform or not, but you're right. It does give us more, more, um, more opportunities to be successful with the community when they see us giving those extra efforts continuously. Exactly. It builds that public trust. And when you build public trust, people call you more often. They report stuff more often. If you've got a community of 20,000 people and you only have less than 100 officers, you have 20,000 extra sets of eyes and ears out there that are reporting crimes. You can reduce crime drastically by having that community trust. And, and that's the key. And, and I see this, like I told you earlier, like when I was chief of police, uh, my first go around in Simpsonville, South Carolina, I took the city with my leadership, with my department, officers busting their tails from number 28 safe city in the state to number one in two years. I came on to this job where I'm at now, a uh, much higher violent crime rate. We were ranked 151st safest city the day I started. We broke the top 40 in nine months. Uh, we're waiting on the new staff to come out. The last month, the uh, 2022 crime report from our state law enforcement division came out. And it showed we're one of the only agencies in our county, much less e agencies of our size, that have reduced crime in every single category across the board. Wow. You know what I'm saying? That's pretty, that's pretty rare. And, I, and I, I pushed that down from, you know, the top. All my command staff has to be on the same page. Push, push, push. I don't believe in procrastination. I'm, 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 my background is predominantly a detective. And, and, and that's how I climb my rank. And I believe that when you get a case, you dig, 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 dig until you solve it. It's just like the, the TV show, the first 48 hours. You know, if you don't get something within the first 48 hours, the probability of solving that crime 
drops drastically. It's the same way with every type of case, not just homicides. So when you're out there and you get a case, you dig and dig. You don't say, well, I'm going to wait and I'm going to do this later. No, do it now because tomorrow will bring another case. And not procrastinating is a major key to success in any position. And it's, 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 I like how you framed it because given all the experience you have had, it takes a lot to, I mean, come back into the Chiefs role. I mean, like you said, you left in 2016, then you went and did some private contracting um, overseas yeah. and all that good stuff. And then you come back to the Chiefs role. Like, what, what actually drove you to get back into that role? <laughs> so I had, uh, I came back, everybody got laid off during COVID. Um, I came back looking to get back in, but when you go through some political stuff like I did in my first chief job, it's sometimes difficult. People don't know if you're the problem or the solution. Despite, you know, all the stuff I did internationally, a lot of people have no clue about that, you know, stateside. So I had just signed uh, a five-year contract with the Department of State. I was named the National Project Manager uh, over the police mission, part of the police mission for a uh, transitional police unit in the nation of Nigeria. Mm-hmm. In Africa, uh, they were having an issue with uh, Boko Haram and ISIS, and we were going to take some members of the Army, convert them to Special Forces police officers, teach them community policing, anti-terrorism, redeploy them into the Northeast to deal with Boko Haram and ISIS. I had hired my staff. I had signed a five-year lease. I had done everything, and this chief job came open. And the chief that was in the position before where I'm at now um, was just appointed by President Biden to be the U.S. Marshal for the state of South Carolina, and I knew her. So I I called her to congratulate her. And uh, she's like, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm about to fly out, you know, in a month to Nigeria to live in Abuja. And uh, I was explaining to her, she's like, oh, that's crazy. But I missed my, like my kids were still young. And I'd already, I just did four years in a row overseas, um, came back during COVID. And now I'm about to go five years. And, and all my children were, you know, elementary, middle and high school. And I just felt like, man, I, I've already missed so much. If I have an opportunity, I'm going to come back. Well, I ended up taking a hundred thousand dollar pay cut just to come back. And for me, that was pretty substantial and it was tough, you know, at first to be able to do that, but it's that we didn't get in this line of work for the money. Although I made great money overseas, I did it more personally for the life experience. Um, I'm, a, I'm a life experience type of guy and that's probably why I've done so many kind of crazy things in my career. And, um, I'm no different from anybody else. I'm not smarter. I'm not better. Um, but I am willing to sacrifice. And when I sacrificed, so did my family. And I just felt like they had sacrificed so much. I'm gonna, I need to be back here. And it was a good move for me, you know, getting back. I, I never had gotten my full retirement, so I needed to get back into the same system. So from that perspective, that was also a, a wise financial move, although I took a pay cut, but I'm moving towards, you know, my final retirement. Well, and, and you know, uh, we're, let's touch on that real quick. And that's important for it, for people to know, like, it's with, and this, like I said, things pop into my head, but this has popped in my head as soon as you said that. Oh, yeah. With all the different recruitment incentives out there nationwide, people are jumping from state to state. And one of the downsides mm-hmm. with that is, like you said, is, Hey, at some point you're going to retire. You're going to need to, but if you're just jumping from state to state, grabbing incentives and you're not in some kind of consistent yeah. state program somewhere, you're going to find yourself looking back 20, 25 years, like, Oh crap, I don't have at least some kind yeah. of pension. And that's kind of, you know, I, that's what I tell people like in the government, no. that's kind of the name of the game. Obviously you're not going to make as much, but you're going to consistently make something that you can have over time versus like a private contract. Yeah. You're going to make more, but as, you never know when that can end. That can be the funding can always be cut for that. Hey, but yeah. a government job, you're not getting like they're not cutting the chief of police salary, like or a position. Like you're always no. gonna have a chief of police salary. No. no, you you make a great point. And that's honestly one of the things that I think I messed up in in my career is I don't regret anything I've done, but so I, I left law enforcement and went become a special agent 
you know, local law enforcement, became a special agent with the DEA. Mm -hmm. I was uh, stationed out in Kansas after a couple of years there. Um, my wife at the time went through a postpartum depression with our, our second child. Uh, I tried to get a move. I was working undercover. We had no support system. We were a 20-hour drive from any family. Um, it was tough. So I, I left the feds to contract overseas because I couldn't afford to have a mortgage in Kansas and a mortgage in South Carolina when I needed to move her back here to a family support system. So I did it several times. So I, I not only left the local state of South Carolina, I went to the feds, and then I went from the feds to international contracting with the feds, which is a, not even a retirement. It's an independent correct, you know, correct. situation Tracks, there. Yeah. And so, so for me, I, I'm, I'm at 25, I'm just over 25 years in, in July, and my buddies are retiring. And I'm pretty high speed, you know, low drag type of guy. I want to work. I'm a high energy guy. So I'll work another 15 plus years in leadership. I, I feel like I got a lot more in me in the tank and I feel good about it. But not having the ability to retire is tough. You know what I'm saying? Not, not being in a position where I have a full retirement check. Like other guys who stayed at the same agency. You know, and that's why I, I touch base on these young officers. They get they get hurt, you know, emotionally because you discipline them when you're really trying to, you know, do constructive work with them. And, and, but you have to let them know the seriousness so they don't repeat it. And, and then they jump ship. And then they some of them, like you said, want to go to another state because they're paying a $7,500 incentive just to come there. But yet they just invested seven years here and now they're going to jump over there and they're starting all over. And their retirement and and that's that's something that I, I would warn any young officer you know if you can stay the same place great but i will say having some diversity in your background at least stay in the same state retirement system because it's helped me tremendously being a chief having worked other places because i i know good and bad when i see it if i don't i don't want to be as good as the environment i grew up in if i only work for one agency and that's sometimes a shortcoming of some guys who just don't know. They they work their way up all the way to maybe even chief in one agency, never worked anywhere else, never saw anything else. How can they really say they, they have reached their maximum potential? You know, I, I don't think they have. I think you can learn so much every agency, good and bad. You see stuff you like, you see stuff you don't like, and you repeat the stuff you like. You're right. And, that, you know, for me, I, I've been in three different agencies and um, one thing that I, I wanted to get into um, and I, and I don't remember anybody telling me, I just kind of, I kind of paid attention to like life. Um, I want to get into the federal yeah. system at some point for, like you said, retirement purposes. Cause the cool part about the feds, especially is that you can move around in any job as long as it's federal and keep your, your retirement building towards something. So yeah. um the the downside is sometimes federal jobs and sometimes they put you in the middle of nowhere. Like you said, like in your case, you were in well, Kansas, you were in the middle of yeah. nowhere, but you were 20 <laughs> hours from family. So you, you, you had to make yeah. some life choices. And it was like, well, I mean, I have a good job. I love, obviously you love, um, cause DEA is right up your alley with the narcotics, but oh yeah, it wasn't yeah, up man. your alley for family. And that same thing. When I left border patrol that it was a family thing. Like cause I, I wanted to be closer to family. It wasn't that, I dislike the work or the pay. I mean, I was a canine handler, take home ride. I mean, making great money. I mean, it was it was amazing. But the family side was more important to me. So you're right. Yeah. Thinking about trying to anchor people, anchor yourselves down somewhere. It doesn't mean you have to work at the same PD for the whole time or the same yeah. sheriff's office. You can move around, but just make sure if you are moving around, somehow you're keeping yourself in some particular retirement system. So let's say you go to five exactly. different PDs. I mean, most of them are municipalities, so it probably won't count. But if it would, make sure that they all fall within the same retirement system. And that way, when yeah. you do decide to finally retire, like you said, after 25 years, you have at least some kind of guaranteed income, especially as you go into the afterlife of law enforcement. Exactly. I mean, that, that's the key. And, and have a, a other, you know, th for me, my books, or a little side hustle, if you know what I'm saying. I do, mm -hmm. I do some speaking stuff. But if I do it where it's my, my uh, city administrator and mayor and all them are great because I'm representing our department. It's like recruiting, so I can't really get paid at speaking events unless I take time off 
or anything like that. So I'm not double dipping, but have, have something else, you know, uh, I felt like, I could pretty much go do about anything I want and be successful in anything I want to be successful in, but public services is, is what I love. Law enforcement is what I love. I love encountering people at a low point in their lives and bringing them up. You know, and some people at a low point in their lives, you encounter them and they never going to get out, you know, but some of those people need to be locked up so you can protect others that they terrorize around. So, I mean, I, I love law enforcement genuinely. I feel like it's a calling. And anybody who puts in, you know, 20, 25 years, whatever amount of time in law enforcement, 10 years, five years, it's a blessing, you know, to have seen the things you've done, but don't let it get you. Don't let all those ups and downs emotionally affect you. You know, have your outlet, work out, do things, talk to people, you know, because this career, you know, you see so many negative things. Um, don't don't let it change you totally. Because it will change you, but don't let it totally change you into a bad person. And it's so easy to go down that path. And one thing, and you know, obviously, Keith, just being in law enforcement, there are a lot of peaks and valleys. And our body technically yeah. is not designed for that. <laughs> we we lie to ourselves and says that <laughs> say we can't handle it, but... I mean, you so when you actually study like things like the human brain and stuff like that, you're like, the human brain doesn't actually oh, like yeah. all of that. Not, not like maybe once a year, the human brain could be cool with that, but doing it five times a day, <laughs> it usually doesn't, it really yeah. does not, it, it's not a long term success. So you're right. You have to be able to look forward and have plans for the future, obviously maintaining your health and all that good stuff because th things are going to get tough no matter what. And as we talked about just throughout the show, in law enforcement, especially what drove you into it early on was the dynamics of it that that brings something different every day. But with that dynamic, you also have to prepare yourself. And I'm it's it's so cool to hear that yeah. you're doing things seven days a week. I mean, like that's just cool because that is leading by example. And like you said, people are watching that and they're gonna mimic that because they appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Practice what you preach. Like I learned that a long time ago from my dad. He's a Marine, 22 years, and he's 75 years old now, still works every day. Uh, they own a bakery for the last 25-plus years. And uh, it's, it's <laughs> hard work, you know. I always prided myself as a leader, and I don't – not everybody's like this, but, you know, be willing to outwork everybody. And sometimes that work is intellectual and sometimes it's physical. Also, as a leader, be willing to step aside sometimes and follow. You know, let somebody else take the leadership reins for a while. And that's sometimes hard as a leader. But great leaders know when to become, you know, just be a part of the team that helps support or take the reins and go up front. And, and that's something you only learn through peaks and valleys and, you know, trials and tribulations and stuff like that. But it's all in all, man, it's, it's what you make of it. Stay positive and you can accomplish anything you want in this career. You're right. Yeah, just stay focused and 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 being the hardest worker in, in everything you do. Um, obviously, effort goes a far way. Attitude, like you mentioned earlier, that that that's important. Um, so if people are looking to find you, whether it's the the get your book, to bring you in to speak, or just talk to you, like what is the best way they can find yeah. you? Yeah, most people kind of like how we met. Most people have reached out to me on LinkedIn. That's uh, under Keith Groundsell, G R O U N S E L L. And uh, that's the best way by far to reach out to me. Um, send me a private message. I'll, I'll respond to everybody. Um, I'm always willing to talk to people. I have a lot of – I have had people on LinkedIn that I've mentored to get into law enforcement, and uh, I get them in, and I don't talk to them anymore. I'll get them in, and they'll still call me. It just, it just kind of varies. And uh, I know my schedule is crazy, but – I believe in giving back because I had some people do it to me early in my career and kind of led me in the right direction and told me things. And, and I've been blessed to have worked at almost every level in law enforcement. So I could give you advice on how to get to certain, certain places. Um, you can also, I, I'm have a TV show that's coming out that I'm going to be in a couple episodes this season. It's called undercover caught on tape. Undercover uh, caught on tape. Okay. 
Yes, that premieres on the A&E Network. Uh, January 11th, I believe, is the, the first episode coming up there. I mean, so that's kind of a, a long story, but a long story short is uh, producers found my books, read my books, contacted me. We went out and filmed. Uh, they put together a, ended up putting together a pilot. They aired it. Uh, A&E wanted it. They aired it. it. It had unbelievable ratings. And then they bought a whole season of it. So that's, that's coming up here January 11th on A&E, Undercover Call on Tape. Check it out. It, it, it premieres undercover officers from all across the United States. It's not just about me. I'm just on the show in a couple, at least a couple of episodes. And then um, it takes their undercover cases that there's actual video. It has to have video. And then it shows the videos, then it interviews the undercovers, it interviews sometimes the suspects, the informants, everybody involved. And it tells you about the psychological, the behind the scenes, everything that goes on. It's, it's like nothing else that's on TV right now, to be honest with you. Um, they have these shows where they show a little bit, but it's nothing like this, I can promise you. It's pretty neat. So check that out. Then check out my books, An Arts Tale. You can get those on Amazon. Um, like I said, they're in, also in audio. You can get them on Audible or through the Amazon link. You can get Kindle, audio, or paperback. Um, I'll have my uh, Caleb's Journey to Kindness, a children's book, which would be great to read to your kids and, and teach them different lessons in life that, you know, we as parents try and instill in them. But sometimes having a book where, you know, they can go to it and point out each individual story and talk about something that your children will encounter during their lifetime is something that's important. And it's just a way to touch and reach out to another audience. As police officers, you know, we're, we're in the business of helping people. And that's where I feel like my books have been able to do that. I've had undercover, I had a guy who worked narcotics 30 years from my book series, An Arc's Tale, uh, contacted me and said, man, he said, I learned more in your books than I did 30 years in narcotics. I said, no way. Wow. He said, yes, and I'll tell you why. I said, why? He said, because I never worked undercover. I, I was plain clothes, but I was never a deep undercover guy. And I didn't understand a lot of what you, what you were talking about, you know, at first. And now I have a grasp of some of the behind the scenes stuff and why drug dealers do this and why the undercovers do this. You say, I wish I'd have read this early on. And it's hard to preach that to people, but I have my narcotics unit. I have copies in, of my books in, in my investigative bureau. And, I, and those guys read them, and I let them listen to the audio. They'll say, hey, what do you do in this case if I'm trying to do this? I'm like, here's the case. Boom. Hit play. And listen, this is, this is the exact case you're doing right now. And uh, so I feel blessed. Now it, it's a young man's game, you know, working undercover, in my opinion. And now I, I mentor the younger generation, and, and that's what it's about for me, and passing on that legacy, passing on that torch, and, and – I tell officers, write your stories, man. You wrote your, you know what I mean? You wrote, write a story, man. We see and, and hear so many amazing things. Uh, people want to know what we do. Humanize us as law enforcement officers through books, through movies, through whatever you can do. Do your best to humanize us so people have more empathy towards law enforcement. The, the vast majority of people support us, but there's that, still that small group of haters out there that we may never win over, but we'll just keep the majority supporting us and, and we'll overrun them. Yeah, and you're right. It's important. I mean, that's, I tell people all the time, I'm like, hey, I said, we all have a story. Just put it in writing. It was like, well, what if nobody, it doesn't matter. Just put it out there. You never know who you're impacting. Like you exactly. said, with your series, I mean, who knew you were going to influence a 30 year um, detective? I mean, that, that yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I mean, you don't know, but if you want to put it out there, you wouldn't be able to benefit them. So that's why I tell people, I said, even if you don't think you're, story is good just put it out there why not I, you don't know you i mean just because yeah. you don't think it's good doesn't mean that a next person is not looking for that information or that motivation or that inspiration <laughs> yeah. so why why not do it so so keith what final words do you have for the audience you know just stay the course in anything you want to do in life you know you're going to have ups and downs you're not going to achieve success tomorrow matter of fact the quick you achieve success the less meaningful it is you know the be best things in life come through struggles and those struggles you shouldn't let them get you off track keep 
pace with your goals. You know, always set goals, short-term, long-term. You know, if you don't have goals, you don't know where you're going. So just stay the course. It'll happen. And enjoy the small wins along the way. And enjoy those around you that have helped you get where you get where you get and appreciate them also. Man, you said it great, man. And it's and it's Keith, you're, you're I, I agree with all of it. So I'm not gonna beat a dead horse and repeat everything because I mean you 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 said it. I mean when you go through things, I mean it's not the end of it. Learn from it and get better because that's gonna be the best way yeah. you you can grow. So very, very good. Very, very strong way to, to, to close out. Audience, folks, people, whoever, you've heard it. You've heard a great hour with Keith. You've heard some of the things he's been doing. And obviously, you guys can tell he is a busy body. He's done a lot of different things that a lot of us think about doing. And now that we've seen someone do it and we've heard someone do it, this is your opportunity to do some things as well, whether it's adopting a child, whether it's writing a book. Um, working internationally, whatever it might be, being a chief of police, whatever that that stretch of your imagination that you were kind of thinking about or wasn't sure, you can see that Keith is a living testament of that. And as you go forward in your life, think about some of the things that he's gone through. And if you have anything that you're wondering about, especially that you've heard him go through, reach out to him. You heard the best, the best platform to get him is LinkedIn. So reach out, contact him, pick his brain, um, get his book, obviously. I mean, that'll give you a lot of insight on on some of the things he's been through, but whatever it is, make sure that's make sure we support each other. And obviously he has a lot of, of, of good experience that can be passed on to all of us. So once again, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. And we hope to hear you and hear from you on the next episode. You guys stay safe and have a good one. You've been listening to the LEO first podcast. Michael has been in law enforcement since 2005. He's worked for three law enforcement agencies in three different states. He's a professional speaker who travels the country teaching about leadership development and self-awareness. And he's the author of a book called Greatness Beyond the Badge, The Three Key Principles for Self-Awareness. It's Michael's passion to bring law enforcement members' stories to the front so you get the real and raw take. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with Michael on YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Michael Laidler. On Twitter at Michael A. Laidler. On Facebook at Michael Laidler Leadership. Send an email to Michael at MichaelALadler.com. And hit the website at MichaelALadler.com. See you next time on the LEO First Podcast.